Welcome to this new lecture of Robotics 2. Today we will start with the second half of our program dealing with control problems. This will uh, occupy us for the rest of the uh, course uh, in many different ways. We will make use of what we have learned so far about dynamic modeling and we will design in fact a number of control laws that achieve different type of tasks that are being assigned to our manipulator. Uh, so in uh, the first thing that I would like to uh, talk about is what do we mean by robot control? If you're posing this question to uh, different people in robotics from industry or from research or academia, uh, you may get different answers. So. Uh, there are in fact a number of different definition or level of definition that can be given to the term robot control. So we are controlling successfully a robot if we are able to complete a given task or a complete work program. But for doing this, uh, we have to solve some intermediate uh, subtasks, typically involving motion. So. Uh, Controlling a robot would also mean, at a lower level of definition, uh, the possibility of executing accurately uh, a desired motion trajectory, no matter if this is uh, defined in the Cartesian space or in the joint space. Eventually, uh, controlling a trajectory means that we are able to bring to zero uh, the position error at a given time. So you see that the complexity of uh, the controller uh, depends also on the objective. The lowest uh, level indeed uh, is needed in order to uh, successfully complete tasks which are defined uh, at a higher level and a larger complexity. Uh, in fact, uh, because of these uh, different types, we will see uh, of uh, different types of uh, uh, interpretation of robot control, uh, we will see that most control systems have uh, an internal structure which reveals a hierarchy. From the direct level control, which is the most frequent and more accurate uh, execution of a subtask, to the highest level control, where more intelligence is involved in order to decide what should be done in face of some uh, unpredicted, unpredicted or uncertain or uh, deviated uh, situations. So uh, the highest level in general in this hierarchy uh, are uh, working at a reduced rate, uh, longer rate, sorry, um, but on more general concepts. The lowest level restrict their focus to very specific uh, objective, but needs to be uh, very fast and very accurate. Uh, indeed, at every level of this hierarchy, uh, we could use, uh, we have indeed different objective, uh, we are using, taking advantage of different models, kinematics, dynamics, and also um, symbolic models, uh, and we use different methods in order to address the control problem in these layers. Now, uh, the, uh, how do we evaluate uh, control? First of all, why do we need control? In order to overcome the fact that uh, the real world is not as we planned, the robot itself is not the ideal device that we uh, assume. So in face of uh, disturbances and uncertainties, uh, a pure planning of the motion would not be enough. So why not? Because uh, we lack in terms of performance. So how do we evaluate performance? Uh, the first is uh, quality of execution of a given task, no matter which level this task is, for the 
purpose of discussion, of presentation, let's imagine that we have a, a trajectory defined, let's say, in the Cartesian space. So, uh, we say that the controller has a good performance if in nominal condition, so when everything should be uh, similar to what we expect at the planning stage, uh, the quality is large enough, which means that we can uh, complete the task at fast speed, uh, or we can uh, be very accurate in positioning uh, we have a large repeatability despite uh, of the repeated um, execution of the same task. Or we could have also uh, an optimal behavior in terms of control because we are using less energy for doing uh, a given task. So there are uh, several uh, functional expression of the objective that we would like to pursue in nominal condition. And uh, typically, we improve the quality also, not only, but also thanks to the use of models, for instance, of dynamic models or uh, accurate calibrated kinematic models. So we can do this by software, uh, leaving alone the fact that if you have a better hardware, uh, you would certainly do uh, better in terms of nominal performance. Indeed, uh, as I said, uh, the condition of operation of robots are typically uncertain and perturbed by a number of uh, factors, internal and external to the robot. So, uh, another way of evaluating the performance is the fact that, despite uh, the condition are not nominal for a number of reasons, the degradation of the performance is limited. So, we have what we call robustness of the control uh, law, which means that we may adapt to the fact that the environment conditions are changed, uh, and despite the presence of uh, uncertainties and also a known um, factor in the model, so for instance a, a poor estimation of the friction effects, or the presence of an unknown payload added, still we are achieving reasonably well the original desired task. And indeed, uh, how can we in, uh, improve robustness of uh, uh, our control scheme? Typically by the use of feedback and the addition of sensor and the proper processing of sensor information so that we can perceive the real state of the system and uh, react to any error with respect to the uh, planet motion. Uh, there's a, another way to improve this, which goes through the fact that we acquire information from experience. Uh, the experience may be gathered by the same robot that does repeat a trial of the same task and learn how to do it at best. If we are have in mind uh, the execution of a trajectory, we may start by commanding through a control law, a feedback control law, the motion of the robot, uh, recording some error, but learning from the error how to do better at the next trial. Or, and we can use uh, some human experience, so we can acquire uh, the needed commands by analyzing a you know, sequence of action that uh, a human is doing in place of the robot, and then the robot may intervene. There are a huge number of possibilities in the learning process, but we will not focus uh, on, on this aspect because we have extra courses uh, dealing with machine learning, and in particular machine learning in robotics. Uh, but we will see one example of a, a iterative uh, learning of the executing of a trajectory without information about the original uh, dynamic model of the robot. So, for uh, accuracy, uh, this is a slide that I showed also to the students of Robotics 1. So, uh, the, the difference between accuracy and repeatability is represented by these four pictures with uh, the center of the target being the um, ground truth. So we would like to have good accuracy and good repeatability, but all this information which qualify the performance of a robot are typically 
limited to the static position. So going back to the same position over and over, uh, repeatability, and this position is the one that was originally intended, so accuracy. What about dynamic accuracy? So what about uh, testing the performance on uh, a number of uh, significant motion trajectories? There are not yet standards that qualify dynamic accuracy because the variety of kinematics, the variety of motion tasks is so large that you cannot uh, write down a specification in a very clear way. Some manufacturers are providing some information, but there's no standard yet on this. And people are working also on how to qualify uh, in dynamic motion what type of trajectory, for instance, you can use in which part of the workplace in order to uh, unify, let's say, the uh, qualification of performance even in a dynamic setting for a robot manipulator. So, uh, with this in mind, uh, essentially there are two basic control schemes that, that we can consider. Uh, the most simple and the original uh, way of commanding robot uh, was to, based on the task, based on the planning of motion, generate from the controller essentially an open loop command, a sequence of commands, that will uh, let the robot move, the robot is moving and is doing some action, like closing the gripper, picking a, an object, moving it to a place position, uh, inspecting with a camera mounted on the end of factor some uh, workpiece, uh, and modifying, in general, the state of the environment. This is the most simple and traditional way of doing things. Of course, you may imagine that if you introduce some perturbation, disturbance, uncertainty in the environment, uh, effect on, on, on the robot, uh, this open loop command will fail to uh, execute correctly the action and therefore the uh, original task. This is why we use sensor information, so perception in general, uh, fed back from the environment to the robot and from the robot to the controller so that we generate, in fact, closed loop commands. Uh, and this closed loop commands may guarantee, and in fact we can study also if they guarantee, uh, accurate, uh, the, the, the satisfaction of the objective, uh, of the constraint, and eventually uh, the correct execution of the whole task. Now for doing this, uh, in these uh, blocks, uh, which represent basic uh, part of the control problem, uh, we use uh, models, and we use models for the robot, kinematic models and dynamic models, as we have now learned. Uh, we use also models for the environment, geometric models, understanding uh, what is the shape of the various parts, where they are, how far they are, uh, if there's a passage between uh, objects so that you can uh, find a collision-free path, and so on and so on. And of course, this model can be uh, assumed a priori or learned from experience or acquired online by sensors. And at the level of control, we use these models together with methods in order to design uh, the input that will drive the motion of the robot. Uh, one thing which is very important to uh, stress is that, in general, uh, although I've separated here open loop from closed loop command, so open loop are typically feed forward commands, so they don't have a feedback part. Closed loop commands have a feedback part, feedback from the sensor information acquired on the robot itself and uh, on its environment. Uh, the best performance I usually obtain by combining both feed forward and feedback commands. This is a general rule for any dynamic system. Uh, there are benefits of using feedback, and we will see them uh, in detail, in particular robustness and uh, insensitivity to disturbance and to parametric uh, 
uncertainty and so on but feedback uh, as an action if there is an error so we sh uh, should have first an error in order in general to apply a, a feedback command so the feed forward term which is typically designed on nominal condition or nominal information complements uh, perfectly the feedback parts in the sense that it anticipates at least in either condition the creation of an error so the feed forward part is there in order to guarantee that in nominal condition everything works fine the feedback part will compensate for uh, non ideal uh, situation uh, introduction of uh, uh, disturbances and so on so that the best of both worlds is obtained by combining both action at the same time and we will see this especially when dealing with trajectory control so at this stage is a, is a good point where uh, I could uh, use some general concept which will help also in classify us in classifying the different methods that design method for designing controller uh, how they how control scheme in particular feedback scheme handle uncertainty uh, by uncertainty we can uh, include also the presence of uh, external disturbances which were not expected so this is also part of the uncertainty or of some intrinsic uh, partial knowledge of the state of the world and of the state of the robot itself so we start with the most simple concept uh, if any of you have taken a course in automatic control in system theory so the principle of feedback which is by the way also bio inspired because it's present in nature in our uh, human body uh, in animals and so on so the feedback is uh, essentially uh, the idea of driving the system not with the desired uh, let's say, um, objective, but with the difference between the desired objective and the current state of the system itself. So this difference, this error, will drive uh, the dynamic system. And in general, feedback control is known to be, to render the closed-loop system insensitive to disturbances and to variation of parameters. Now, indeed, disturbances should not be so large, so mild disturbances, and similarly, variation of parameters should be quite uh, small in order to guarantee that a standard feedback control law designed without knowing uh, the entity and uh, the source of these disturbances and variation of parameters may continue to work reasonably. If this is not the case, because the uncertainties are relatively large, for instance, uh, we may introduce an additional action in the feedback control law, which is a robustifying action. And typically, robust control uh, is able to uh, tolerate uh, larger uncertainty, provided that you know their range of variability. For instance, uh, if we design a control uh, for a robot that carries a nominal payload of 5 kilograms, uh, if the payload is 10 kilograms, uh, pure feedback control may not uh, achieve accurate position or positioning within some specified um, tolerance, while uh, adding a robustifying action in the feedback control, knowing that the uh, payload may range between, say, uh, one kilogram and ten kilogram, then uh, we are able to um, satisfy some prescribed uh, accuracy. Uh, indeed, if the uh, range of uncertainty is huge, uh, robust control itself will not be able to do this or will require an, an incredible large amount of effort. So, uh, motors that are subject to wear and tear. And this is why, uh, 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 as, a third, as a third step in this hierarchy of uh, complexity you know, of control scheme, uh, the third level, or the next level, let's say, uh, is going adapt. Uh, what do we mean by that? Because 
if we don't know the range of uncertainty, or if this range may be even very large, then uh, we cannot be confident that the fixed scheme control law uh, is able to do the job. And this is why we need to include some dynamic aspects, so modification, online modification of the control law, which adapts to the fact that uh, the uncertainty is so large and unknown a priori. So uh, we will see in particular a successful uh, design of adaptive control which are able to execute trajectories of bringing to zero the error in uh, following and tracking a, a desired trajectory despite uh, no knowledge a priori of the model. However, adaptive control in fact builds up some internal estimate of uh, the state of the robot and of the environment if it's in interacting with the environment uh, and so it needs some internal structure that uh, will be adapted still driven by the error so it's still a feedback scheme but it has some dynamic it's not an instantaneous computation so the output of an adaptive controller typically uh, depends on the state of the robot on the error with respect let's say to a motion trajectory if we take this as uh, paradigmatic task to be executed uh, and in addition uh, the output of the control law will depend also on the internal state of the controller so the controller is itself a dynamic system we will see this in more detail when we uh, present the adaptive control schemes now if you move farther uh, you enter into a domain which becomes uh, let's say with fuzzy boundaries, the domain of intelligent control. So in, under this big uh, name, uh, we mean a, a number of uh, possible uh, control law. Typically, a uh, classical one is uh, improving performance through learning from experience. So learning from uh, a number of tasks that you use for, uh, let's say, tune your, uh, your controller and then validate on a, a, a new set of uh, tasks and be ready to generalize to tasks that have not been encountered in the learning phase. And this learning may be uh, left uh, on for all the duration of the life of the robot so that uh, this long-term learning uh, is being used uh, um, over and over. Now, uh, again, another aspect of this uh, intelligent control is that the structure itself of the control law is not fixed a priori. One typical example of uh, this situation is the use of neural nets. Uh, in a neural nets, we have a generic structure which may be applied to a robot manipulator, to an airplane, to controlling the uh, uh, um, uh, photo camera and so on and so on so independently of the domain of interest at least in principle and through a number of experience you modify the internal weights between the neurons of the nets so the weighting the activation function and so on all the parameters that you have so that you end up with a particular internal structure which is optimized for the a particular system and task that you're uh, trying to um, execute and in addition with the capability of handling also tasks that have not been seen before so all this uh, it's a it's a wide area you can include in intelligent control as I said uh, learning deep learning neural nets in particular um, uh, support vector machines, uh, genetic algorithms, fuzzy uh, schemes, uh, and combined fuzzy neural methods, and so on and so on. It's a very large domain uh, of uh, research. Uh, unfortunately, uh, until recently, uh, without proof of performance, uh, as opposed to what we can do with more traditional control law uh, feedback controller, robust controller, adaptive controller, 
where we can show that something works under certain condition with a formal proof. Uh, there's a, another aspect which is uh, to be uh, underlined in this general presentation of control schemes of uh, growing uh, intelligence, I would say, uh, and less accuracy in a, in a sense, as we, as we mentioned at the beginning, talking about hierarchical structure. So, uh, if you have a parameterized uh, control law, which is based maybe on a parameterized model of the system that you need to control, in our case, a robot manipulator, then the uncertainty is typically on the values of the parameters. We have seen that uh, we can uh, do experiment in order to identify those numbers, those dynamic coefficients, for instance, in the dynamic model of a robot manipulator. However, there are more uh, complex situations where you don't know the system structure and therefore you may not know also the structure of the controller which is most appropriate for your system. So, in this sense, self-organization and learning uh, go beyond the simple identification of numbers to be put into uh, a model and to be used by the controller. Okay, now, uh, let's go back to Earth and look at what happens in industrial robots. Of course, I'm talking now not of uh, new generation and research-oriented robots, but the classical industrial robot that you can find on the factory floor. What are the limitations of control? Well, there are many points of view that can be taken in this, in this uh, listing this limitation. For instance, from a functional uh, viewpoint, uh, most of the controller uh, that are coming with the robots or produced by the manufacturer are closed control architecture. So, uh, systems that are intended not to be touched by a generic user, not even by an experienced user, uh, and only because of this, the manufacturer can guarantee or certify uh, performances, uh, the, the quality of the performance uh, of the robot. However, this closed control uh, architecture uh, makes difficult to open the control system for interfacing uh, them to new sensor, uh, external computing sense, uh, system to develop more advanced and more focused uh, application. And this is especially true, so uh, industrial robot controller uh, may accept external signals, this is uh, um, coming from sensor, typically from cameras, from four-star sensor and so on, but the request of a hard real-time operation, so a real-time operation with fixed limits of sampling time that cannot be uh, overruled, uh, is difficult. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's quite difficult. Uh, you may range typically uh, on a with um, a loop cycle of the order of uh, tens of milliseconds, whereas you may need to update your command using your external resources, sensing and computation resources, uh, let's say every one millisecond. Okay, so this is typically not possible with a closed control architecture. Now, uh, apart from this, uh, internal to the uh, industrial controller for uh, industrial robots, at the higher level, you typically have a very loose or absent way of using sensory feedback in order to define uh, task command. So the task generation and the sequence of activities that the robot should do is typically an open loop uh, design made by, from the knowledge of the uh, operation that, that needs to be completed, uh, from the experience of the programmer, and so on and so on. Uh, if we go down to the hierarchy of control levels, so at an intermediate level, uh, a couple of limitations that I can uh, identify are the following. First of all, a limited, in, bo in both cases, a limited consideration of 
aspect that we are dealing with uh, in our robotics courses in academy. So both advanced kinematic issues and dynamic issues. For instance, uh, at the kinem kinematic level, the fact that uh, the issue of singularity, which is very delicate for every industrial robot, in fact, it's a problem that is well known, it's typically solved on a case-by-case -case basis. All the methods that we have seen, uh, for instance, uh, both in uh, uh, for the damped z-square method and uh, you know, relaxation of uh, uh, some part of the task in order to avoid the generation of uh, large commands at the joint level, so all the re singularity robustness techniques are typically disregarded. Probably things are changing nowadays, but this is the current status. The other aspect is task redundancy. This is a very important point. Why? Because when uh, a manufacturer produces a robot, let's say a 60 degrees of film robot, uh, this is intended for doing tasks that requires six joints, uh, so in the Cartesian space, typically position and orientation. So if uh, you have a, a task for which the robot becomes redundant, then you have to readapt all the software to this situation. So the extra degrees of freedom that becomes available, in fact, they don't know what to do. And typically they freeze those extra degrees of freedom in such cases. For instance, if the robot has to execute uh, uh, an arc welding in which uh, position is important, three-dimensional position is important, and orientation is only important in the sense of pointing, so there's one extra angle that is left for any other purposes, then they just freeze one of the, uh, let's say, wrist joints, in particular if they have a spherical wrist, and they get along with the five degrees of freedom rod. And then maybe from time to time they update uh, the frozen joint to a new configuration. So they don't do this continuously in an optimized way, as we know that this could be done. <coughs> finally, sorry, uh, finally, when we go down to the direct level, the one that uh, is executed on the motors, on the motors, on the actuators, electrical motors most of the time, um, what are the limitations? One limitation is the control band, which means that uh, we have extra heavy mechanical structure which limits also the speed of motion. Indeed, if we were able to have a lightweight structure and to compensate for any vibration or oscillation that may be induced by this and still achieve the same uh, fast trajectory execution, then we will increase the control bandwidth in a sense. Uh, the other thing is dynamic accuracy, as we mentioned before. In static accuracy, there is not a particular problem. But if we start moving fast and faster, let's say at the order of uh, acceleration of 5G or even more, then uh, kinematic control alone and the use of conventional low-level PID loops independent one to the other at the joint level, so one PID for each joint, uh, will end up with a reduction of a dynamic accuracy. There are other problems that uh, need to be addressed, and this can be addressed both from a design point of view, from a mechanical point of view, uh, from a system point of view, and as well from a control point of view. So, for instance, the problem of uh, a, a special form of friction, like dry friction, or the presence of backlash in the transmission. These are problems that are quite hard to address. In fact, as I'm saying at the bottom of the slide, uh, this can be handled, for instance, by substituting uh, uh, actuators and reduction elements with direct drive actuators, provided that the actuators are able to produce enough torque uh, with a uh, uh, low speed rotation of the motor themselves, which is not the case. They require special de specially designed actuators. Um, the other... Uh, 
sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other problem that is quite present and that the robot control uh, is not able to handle, if not by reducing speed and reducing uh, exerted contact forces uh, in the contact, is the presence of compliance in the strut. For instance, if you have harmonic drives, uh, so elements, reduction elements with very large reduction ratio, but which introduce flexibility um, by themselves, same with uh, belts and long shafts, which are not reduction element in general, but just uh, displace the axis of motion. Uh, and similarly, uh, if you have relatively uh, la uh, lightweight and in general large manipulator, you may have compliance distribution distributed along the limb. Now, uh, for the green square that I uh, added to this list of limitation, indeed, the use of better dynamic models, for instance, for flexible transmission, models that take into account the elasticity at the joint, as we have seen, this is a particular uh, extension of the standard dynamic modeling for uh, rigid robots, uh, will certainly help uh, because you can use this model also for the design of a model-based control, which uh, takes into account this effect and try to compensate in the best way using feedback. Now, uh, one last point is that this compliance in the structure, in particular the presence of flexible joints, uh, was a, a parasitic effect in traditional industrial control. So something that we had to live with, for instance, if you wanted to use a harmonic drive in order to increase the torque available at the link side uh, for a given amount of torque produced by the motors, uh, then we have to live with this. Mm? So we have to uh, compensate or limit the performance because of the presence of this flexibility. Uh, similarly, uh, if we have large structure, uh, mechanical designer tends to make these uh, large structures heavy because uh, by adding mass, adding inertia, the first resonance of the system uh, would increase in frequency so we would become, uh, would go outside the control bandwidth, so it will not be excited by the normal operation of the robot. Indeed, if we speed up motion, we increase the control bandwidth and we may hit uh, this uh, oscillation frequency with a degradation of performance. So this was, uh, and is still, the actual situation for traditional industrial robot. But uh, lately, um, by opening mm, the cages of uh, operation of robots, making them lighter and making them softer or compliant, uh, was found to be very useful, especially when the robot needs to cooperate or collaborate or interact with human next to them. So a situation which is typically uh, discarded in traditional uh, hard automation. So in order to be safe, uh, some compliance in the structure should be included and of course the handling of the compliance uh, by the controller should be included as well. We'll see that uh, in physical human robot interaction this is an important aspect. So compliance is present on purpose also for other reasons but essentially for making this system safer being light and being and having the heavy motors decoupled from the light links by the joint compliance for instance reduces the energy transfer to the environment in particular a human being in case of an accidental collision so uh, in this video uh, which is a german video as you can tell from the from the writing on top of it uh, we can see what, what is the problem uh, in the presence of joint elasticity. For instance, just for robotic position. So we are not dealing here with uh, trajectory tracking. The robot uh, is a, a 6R KUKA arm, 
uh, very heavy, 235 kilograms uh, of total mass of the robot. Now here is holding uh, a very heavy payload, 15 kilograms. This is uh, at the border of its um, rated uh, value of the data sheet. And the system is standing still. So uh, the controller just keeps the current configuration of the joint, so the robot should not move. And uh, now you will see what happens if you apply an external force in this situation. You see that there are oscillations. Mm. Oscillation without the design, uh, this is the German um, writing, without the design of a special control that takes into account joint elasticity. Okay, so the motors are practically uh, fixed in their commanded position, but the fact that beyond uh, the motor position there is some elasticity in the transmission uh, will make the system react with vibration to an external applied force. To be uh, fair, I should say that this video is at least, uh, I would say, 13 years old, so I'm not blaming KUKA or those type of uh, KUKA robots for uh, having this type of performance. Maybe in between they have improved their behavior. So, um, what is our purpose? Uh, our purpose here is to study in detail the problems and be able to develop new advanced robot controllers and then bring them to practice uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, robots are working in the industry or in the very near future there will be also lightweight robots in the domest domestic area and in other uh, situation. So uh, what do we mean by advance in robot controllers? Well first of all uh, following a model-based approach which means that uh, all what we have developed so far can be used in order to design and prove the performance of novel control laws. Uh, among the advanced methods, we certainly include those that provide feedback from a number of external sense. First of all, what we call visual serving. So the fact that the motion of the control is driven by a vision-based system, a camera or a depth sensor or a combination of them. Equally, uh, if we are used sensor, a four-store sensor, a CD four-store sensor, for controlling motion and interaction with the environment. So when the robot is in contact with the environment, so we use all this information together with models of their behavior in order to design more advanced control laws. And then there are more new methods because after all, using uh, improved model and uh, generalized feedback from sensor is already the present. Okay. Now the new method, uh, the new trends uh, goes in different directions. We mentioned already the learning one, this is exploding nowadays, and I can name uh, some specific type of learning, so iterative learning on repetitive tasks, or learning by imitation, uh, so a robot imitating a human, or a robot imitating a robot that is already experienced on the task, or a collective uh, learning of a group, of a team of manipulators from the each and single experience, uh, or skill transfer, so how do you um, transfer from a human or from previous experience by the same robot or by other robot, how do you transfer the skill to a new robot? And another type of uh, new methodology that are coming uh, are going exactly in this uh, direction of integration of open loop slash feed forward action with closed loop slash feedback action, all sensory driven. 
So, uh, traditionally, motion planning in robotics, and I'm, I'm, this is a general uh, trend, but in robotics in particular, motion planning uh, is something that you do knowing everything in advance. So, knowing the robot, knowing the start, the goal, the environment, the obstacles, whatever. And then try to solve, uh, to find uh, a feasible motion that goes from the goal, from the, from the start to the goal. And indeed, algorithms are very sophisticated, the problem will become very complex, but eventually you can give an answer. So you have complete solution most of the time, or probabilistically complete solution, in the sense that you can say if a solution exists and you can provide one, or if there is no solution. So there is no feasible path joining the start configuration with the uh, goal configuration. So these are quite powerful methods, but they assume a number of things. On the other side, there are, let's say, uh, sensory-based feedback methods, which are reactive ones. So we react to the fact that knowing the goal and trying to bring to zero the error with respect to the goal, we discover uh, new obstacle on the way, we have repulsive action, we should avoid contact and so on, so we react locally, uh, trying to preserve, let's say, uh, a collision-free motion and trying to get to the destination. Now, these local schemes are very efficient, uh, typically computationally less demanding than motion planning, but needs to be done in real time and have no proof, in general, to be successful. So, we have two words that have been, that have developed over the years in parallel, but only recently people started to try to merge the best of both words together. Which means, from the motion planning point of view, the main criticism was, well, but if the environment changes, what do you do? So, because of the efficiency gained by the algorithm, you can use sensor information and replan as fast as possible. Actually, almost at the rate of one millisecond sometimes. So fast replanning using sensor information is the new trend in motion planning. On the other side, what is the new trend or one of the new trends in feedback control? The fact that the feedback control is blind on the future. It has no information on what is coming next. So if we could uh, add to the current feedback information some preview of the future, then we could optimize the behavior in the next uh, window, let's say preview window, and then uh, apply one part, just the first part of this control strategy, and then redo the same using the new feedback and the new information. So a continuous optimization online with a moving horizon that goes from now to some instant in the future. This is essentially the basic of what is called model predictive control. So it's a model-based technique using feedback, but also having some prediction of the future, uh, which is, in a sense, open loop. So this two uh, concept, and in fact, the group of researchers that have been working on this uh, over the years are now sl slowly getting together to solve the, uh, let's say, the uh, holy grail, to find the holy grail of robotics. So under this sense, um, some of the things that we will see are, are useful. So for instance, uh, uh, going back to the use of sensor information, this is a uh, an old video, but I'm very fond of it. Uh, uh, it's a visual-based control for um, uh, collision avoidance between a lightweight robot. In fact, this robot is a, a prototype that uses McKibben actuators, which are uh, agonistic-antagonistic muscle type of pneumatic actuation, uh, which are compliant, in fact. And, and uh, the, st the, the system is uh, a 3R robot in space. 
uh, and there's a camera overlooking the scene, more or less in the position that you see. So what would we mean by vision-based control? The original task, uh, in the absence of a human, was to move the robot in this sense. You see that it's a bit jerky because of the compliance. Of course, if you intervene uh, and bar the original trajectory, you will have a collision. Not very dangerous because the, uh, the system is compliant and lightweight. But if you can use the visual information in order to find a different way to get to the final end configuration, and in this case, a repulsive for field was used using stereo camera information, you have achieved uh, a more autonomous uh, and more performing uh, execution of the task using, in this case, a feedback which is visual based. Now, if we <coughs> look at the uh, structure of, uh, of uh, the control unit, a functional structure of the control unit, uh, we can recognize uh, on the left side a sequence of activities. So we start by programming the task, the task is subdivided in elementary subtasks. For each subtask, you may have some trajectory to be generated, so planned and executed. And then the trajectory is given as a reference to the direct control algorithms that command the actuators that move the robot, and the robot with the same effector changes the state of the environment. This is the typical workflow of a robot. And now closing uh, the loops means, for instance, from the level, from the point of view of sensor, using a, a huge variety of sensors. Uh, here I'm listing uh, all that I had in mind, but let me add even more. Uh, we have classified uh, sensor in two categories, proprioceptive sensor and exteroceptive sensor. The proprioceptive sensor is a sensor that uh, uh, gives information on the internal state of the robot, so for instance position and velocity, or joint torque sensor uh, mounted on the joint of the, of the robot, and so on. While exteroceptive sensor are typically those that give information on the environment or on the relative position uh, of the robot with respect to the environment and possibly also on the exchanged forces. For instance, a four-tor sensor mounted on the, on the wrist of a manipulator uh, provides information on the contact force and torques that are exchanged between the end effector and the environment when the end effector is in contact with the environment. And you can see from the blue lines and green lines in this slide how we use typically this information, closing loops at different level. Uh, this is a, again a representation of the hierarchy of the system. Okay. Uh, among the exteroceptive sensors, so the green line, you may also consider virtual ones. So, uh, using typically models, for instance, the dynamic model of the robot in order to generate signals which, uh, with their excitation, signifies the occurrence of some event. For instance, uh, we will see that we are able to detect faults in actuators, the fact that the motor is not delivering the torque that you are requesting to it, or you can detect contact in a generic point in the structure, Without using extra sensor, only the proprioceptive sensor are used in that case, in particular the position sensor, the encoders. Uh, so you generate a signal which is act like a virtual force or a touch sensor in case of a collision, or a sensor that detects a fault uh, in the behavior of a motor. So this, I call this virtual uh, sensor, uh, and we'll see that there are very successful and very reliable once the model is a very good one. Remember that uh, every sensor that you add you wins something, but you also prone to sensor failure. So sensors are typically the first things that will fail in the system, followed by actuation and then other mechanical aspects. Another way of looking at the functional structure of a control unit is uh, looking at the programming languages that are being used. Again, each level, each aspect 
is best handled by a proper uh, programming language. Uh, there are, we mentioned Robotics 1, there are uh, uh, dedicated robotics programming language which are uh, classified into task-oriented, object-oriented, and robot-oriented. For instance, a task-oriented language uh, would just specify a high-level command, mm -hmm. a, a task level, like inserting uh, a peg, let's say peg number one, into one of the many holes present in the, in the environment, let's say into hole five. Uh, if I program uh, the motion of the robot in this way, then once I have a confirmation that this is being executed, I have to update also the state of the world, which includes also the state of the robot. Where is the end effector at the end, if the people is open or closed? Where are the various objects being moved from which frame to which frame, and so on and so on. But as you can see, it's very oriented to the task. The, the robot is not there at all. Okay. Object-oriented uh, becomes uh, more uh, related to the various basic components uh, describing the geometry and the kinematics of the uh, robot and the task. For instance, uh, if we move to a specific frame uh, and we move with some approximation, for instance, following a, a linear path or going to that frame, but then uh, overflying that position orientation to process the next one and so on and so on. So you see that you introduce more information into the planning of motion. And if you go down to the robot oriented level, then you address, for instance, individual joints. For instance, you, have, you ask a joint uh, three to move by a certain amount of degrees and so on. So you see that uh, at this level, you don't know what you're doing this. And while if you move up to the task-oriented level, you know that you're inserting the peg into a hole. So uh, you can imagine that this gets decomposed. Most uh, industrial uh, robotics languages are either robot-oriented or object-oriented, while task-oriented languages are more uh, research. On the other hand, you don't need to use a, a programming language which is uh, let's say, issued by one specific manufacturer. KUKA has its KRL language, KUKA robot language. Uh, Unimation had, uh, um, many years ago, a VAL language. Uh, and <coughs> essentially, <coughs> ABB has a rapid programming language for its robot. They are all look-alike, but unfortunately, they are not compatible. Uh, nonetheless, you can develop uh, your own codes for addressing task programming, trajectory programming, control law, direct control law programming, and so on. And here I'm mentioning a, a number of standard, uh, um, standard languages that you can use. Uh, most of the time uh, we use in the lab, in the robotics lab, C++, but uh, other aspects and can be programmed in Python or even in MATLAB with the real-time uh, workshop interface that converts this in real-time uh, C++ languages. And of course, if you have to reason about a logical aspect or list, you can use a higher level language like originally Lisp and other similar. Uh, now, in industrial robots, of course, when we are dealing with programming the task and even with planning trajectory, uh, these problems are often addressed using the teach box. So the interface that the programmer has, where you can move the single joint or you can move uh, uh, in a coordinate way the end effector in the uh, word frame, in the end effector frame, can go along straight line, do cir uh, arc of circle, and so on. So you can uh, write down a skeleton of your programming by pushing the buttons and moving with the joystick the robot to the next position. So you're, in fact, programming the task. And in particular, then you can specify some 
parameters so that at the trajectory level uh, you specify, for instance, the percentage of maximum speed that should be uh, used while moving on a straight line in the Cartesian space or on a straight line in the joint space and so on and so on. So you don't need an extra program for doing this for a conventional industrial robot. Of course, if you move to the programming environment, you have a lot of uh, other opportunities and facilities uh, to use. Finally, uh, the other aspect which is relevant when, when you go through all the steps of a, uh, uh, of a control program uh, is the use of different models. So how do you model the task? How you can use uh, uh, artificial intelligence technique in order to discover if from a certain initial state you can follow a feasible path of states getting there where you, your goal is being placed uh, and you can use a different methodology for doing this including, I don't know, petri nets for instance at the level of trajectory planning we have seen that we use geometric and kinematic models including all coordinate transformation needed for moving from the joint space to the Cartesian space and vice versa and eventually from the joint space to the actuator space if the models are not mounted exactly uh, at the given uh, uh, at the joint that they will move uh, and so on and so on. For direct control arguments, when we will deal with dynamic control, we will use uh, nonlinear methods which are model based and in fact they use exactly the dynamic model of the robot that we have developed so far. In the design we assume uh, let's say a uh, to have available a Lagrangian model or Lagrangian model terms, in the implementation we know that we can do much better, much faster computation, especially if the number of joints is large, by resorting to a Newton-Euler uh, evaluation. Uh, when we go down, when we include the dynamic of actuators, we have an electro electromechanical model as well. And eventually the robot will uh, modify with its uh, end effect, a gripper, uh, whatever, uh, the environment. So we need also a word modeling of the environment, which may be structured or unstructured in the sense that um, we specify exactly the geometric form, shape of the object, or we just have region of occupancy or non-occupancy. And this model may be known a priori or acquired. Uh, in the first phase or even online from onboard sensor. Okay. Um, here in the next three slides, I have uh, listed uh, and updated uh, exactly uh, these days uh, a list of open source software related to robots, uh, general to robot control, to uh, perception, so processing of sensor, in general for doing research in robotics. And these open sources do uh, one or more of the following things. They are able to simulate the behavior of a robot or uh, as a support for real-time control programming. Uh, they can interface with other devices, with other pieces of software, with sensors, with virtual sensor, and essentially they are tools which enable uh, rapid prototyping of uh, control methods. So I'm listing uh, a number of them that have their own merits. You may know, for instance, the Player Stage, pro player stage project uh, that now uh, has been decoupled in two parts. So um, the stage part uh, was intended for supporting a number of different hardware uh, in, a, uh, in a net configuration with some form of abstraction so that you don't specify the specific hardware but the type of hardware that you are including. 
But eventually these parts developed uh, into a, a simulation environment, especially for team of mobile robots. And this is what you can find in the GitHub uh, under the address. Those links are uh, clickable. Uh, the other component of the original player stage system uh, also developed independently and has become what is known to be Gazebo, which is a 3D robot simulator, very sophisticated, with a physics engine which is called ODE, uh, which the acronym stands also for Ordinary Differential Equation, but this is not the sense of the acronym, acronym but it, remem it reminds us that uh, we need to integrate differential equation with different boundary condition, with contact, non-contact, uh, very difficult in general. So this is all embedded in Gazebo, where you can create object and then simulate their motion. And for the rendering, is, this system is based on uh, Ob OpenGL uh, library, uh, and you can find more detail. Maybe you have used already this system uh, in the Gazebo scene.org link. Uh, another very useful uh, and freeware, in fact, is Coppelia Sim. Now, Coppelia Sim is the new name since November 2019, I guess, of what was known under the name of Virep. In fact, even in the logo they are using from the creators of Virep because this was, in fact, a very success. VREP is a commercial product, but it has an educational version which is free and which contains everything you can uh, imagine that you may need. And the characteristic of this, uh, uh, let's say, simulator is that it can be interfaced uh, um, through uh, different methods like embedded script or uh, plugins or it may become a ROS node, so it may be interfaced to other objects. It can, uh, you can write motion controller directly in C or C++ or in other languages. It can be interfaced to MATLAB. There's a very nice interface that you can do. You can uh, simulate your system in MATLAB, which is very accurate for an elemental situation, like free motion of a multi-degree of freedom manipulator and the output can be uh, interfaced to Coppelia which does the animation so you can have a very fancy animation of uh, scenes with multiple robots and other objects you can simulate sensors and things like that and you have this interface in one direction and in the other in MATLAB uh, another very uh, useful uh, object is the robotics toolbox developed by Peter Kork, uh, a very famous Australian researcher in robotics. And in the robotics toolbox you have many, if not all, of the things that we have seen uh, about kinematics, about dynamics, about trajectory planning, somewhat control, but in addition also uh, very useful uh, uh, routines for vision and vision-based control. Uh, the releases are two. Uh, the release nine is uh, related to the first version of Peter Cork's book on uh, robot vision and control, and uh, uh, release ten is uh, one to one with the second edition of the same book. And there is also some uh, elementary, let's say, graphical. Uh, output that you can use to represent in a skeleton fashion your robot. Or you can interface this, as I said, to more sophisticated uh, animator and simulator like uh, the former VREP, now Coppelia C. Another piece of software which is uh, of paramount importance is ROS. Now you have heard certainly about ROS. ROS by itself is a, uh, from a computer science point of view is a middleware. So it uh, has a number of objects that are enabled to connect sub part of a unique software development project. So it's abstracting from hardware, it has drivers for specific devices, there are a number of libraries being added, is an open source project, so 
you can combine different parts provided that you have the correct ROS interface so you can develop your own module and use module developed by some other and the way in which this module um, um, exchange information is through message, pa uh, message passing uh, and uh, other form of uh, blackboards. Um, the nodes in a ROS environment are executable codes, typically in C++, but also in Python, and uh, they uh, use data and they write data uh, in a publish subscribe communication style. And you can find in ROS a state-of-the-art algorithm for vision, for control, for kinematics, and so on and so on. And the more you have, the more you can add. But remember that this is not the solution per se. It's just the middleware that allows you to incorporate methods. You can have a whole bunch of empty boxes, which constitute the skeleton of your robotic program, and those boxes may be uh, filled in with modules existing or with modules that you have developed. So eventually you have to develop turn inside one of these nodes your code in C++. Uh, the other message that I would like to convey to you is that uh, a full C++ implementation is certainly more efficient. It may not be modular, it may not be understandable from the outside, it may not be reusable, so or big limitation for software codes, but it is the most efficient for your specific case. So there's a trade-off depending on uh, what you want to do and what you want to reuse and how, uh, let's say, general your application should be in order to choose uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, ROS methodology or go with your own codes in C++ or Python. Talking about Python, uh, this is also a very active area. There is a, um, a project which is called PyRobotics, recently not updated. I know that there are groups that have developed uh, another kind of environment which is called PyRobots, uh, so I'm just mentioning here for you. And last but not least, uh, I would like to mention also uh, project that has been dismissed but was developed originally here at DIAC by the group of Professor Nardi and Professor Yocchi, which is OpenRDK, in which there were several agents, this was intended mainly for the RoboCup but not only, uh, in which they were using a, a communication of the Blackboard type with modules that are activated or disactivated, exchange information in this way, Essentially, it was an early version of ROS. Okay, so I'm mentioning here, the um, link is still uh, up, but of course this project has been dismissed. I'm putting here just for historical reason. And last but not least, there has been a European project um, some time ago, I guess that now it's more than 10 years ago, uh, under the name of Oracos. The leading partner was the... Uh, uh, University of uh, Leuven, Q, uh, QU Leuven, uh, in Belgium, uh, Oracos, which stands for Open Robot Control Software. Again, uh, they had uh, produced a number of libraries, for instance here you can see the uh, filtering, Bayesian filtering library, or a full library for kinematics and dynamics of uh, um, manipulators, including also parallel uh, kinematic chains and so on. Uh, one particular thing, it goes, it runs under different operative systems, so Linux, and, and Mac OS, and also uh, Windows. Uh, open source as well, this was the whole idea. It inter interfaces also with ROS, and in particular, uh, it can use the CORBA facilities, which means that you can allocate the computation uh, of each modules to a different um, computing unit, which are connected uh, in a network. So you do distributed computation 
by using these facilities, if you wish. And you can find more information on the GitHub version of, of, of this uh, software. And here I would like to um, show one possible application of using Oracles. Why do you need to set up the system? Essentially because you use, now let's start the video in between, uh, you see that you have two, camera, two, two robots here, you have a four-star sensor, you have a camera, you have person around that you have to monitor, you have a laser scanner and so on. And you have all this object uh, have their own uh, uh, controller, but all these parts need to exchange information and collaborate in order to make things su successful. So this task in particular what, uh, is what we will see, it's a hybrid force velocity uh, control task. So the first robot is holding a tool and is following a, a surface uh, that may be unknown, by the way. Uh, so it's, surface, it's following the, the, the boundary of the surface, which is being moved by another robot while applying a force in the normal direction. So we're controlling the normal force and the tangent velocity um, with the first robot. Uh, all this task is subject to the presence of human. So when the human, which is represented by one of these figures on the uh, box bottom left, is the yellow figure in particular, uh, is moving, when it's getting too close, probably the system, although it's moving quite slowly, will have to stop or to slow down its motion. So this was one original idea developed at uh, Kuhleuven on the Department of Mechanical Engineering, but the project ha have, has developed farther on. So you can see that how to let different uh, devices uh, collaborate and exchange information, and therefore you need such type of software environment. Uh, the video continues, but I think that we have seen uh, enough so far. So, let me summarize and then we'll make a short break. Uh, to improve the performance of uh, current robot controllers, we may need a more complete modeling, which includes kinematic dynamics and uh, use of kinematics, for instance, in case of redundancy, best use of the kinematic information, and introduction of sensory feedback uh, in many levels, not only at the direct level, but also at the trajectory planning level, that's also indeed at the task level, uh, eventually. Now, use at the low level, use of dynamic control, and we will see now a, a basic distinction between kinematic and dynamic control uh, in the second part of the lecture, uh, allows in principle to uh, do one of the two things, or uh, on a given trajectory, so path and timing law, achieve much higher dynamic accuracy, or, uh, let's say, given the path and not given the timing law, uh, you can execute with a faster timing law, so with larger velocity, uh, the um, overall trajectory with the same accuracy. Of course, these are two complementary view of the same problem. Why you can do this? Because you have modeled and you are using in the design of your control room all the information about the dynamics of the system. Uh, there are other ways for improving things, but they involve hardware and software. So mechanics, electronics, which is the hardware part, and control, which is the software part. So, uh, if we want to do advanced control, we should be able to uh, use lightweight and compliant robots and being able to control them as accurately as uh, rigid or stiff, massive robots. Another aspect is that we can we would be able, at the control level, to utilize redundancy, in particular task-related redundancy, which is a concept which is purely software. As we have seen, uh, redundancy is not, it's a relative concept, it's not pertaining to a robot per se. 
And of course, there are other ways that you can do uh, from a mechanical point of view, together with making robots more lightweight and introducing compliance, uh, typically at the joints. The mechanical design may uh, reach the goal of reducing the, control, the computational control effort. What do we mean by that? For instance, we have seen that using closed kinematic chains may simplify the robot inertia matrix, making it diagonal or even constant and diagonal, so eliminating the coilless and centrifugal terms and allowing at this point the use of direct drive actuators so that uh, friction effect and backlashes are eliminated uh, from scratch, uh, still you don't have the complexity of a uh, uh, of a um, non-linear model to deal with in the design of the controller of these motors. So, all this, uh, there are many more possible uh, ways of improving performance. Uh, indeed, they come for a cost. So, uh, the application should justify any additional cost that you may incur in the design and also in the setup of the system. For instance, in human-robot interaction, safety becomes fundamental, so you are indeed forced to use lightweight robots, introduce compliance and have smart controllers that guarantee safety. Or if you want to uh, do laser cutting uh, with metals, uh, where you can reach acceleration up to 10 G, at that level, the accuracy in execution of the task should be uh, at the dynamic level because the acceleration involved are so large that conventional controller may not be able to uh, do the job for you. So let me uh, stop for a moment now. <laughs>